I had the opportunity to have a conversation with the Honorable Lisa Hanna, member of the Jamaican Parliament and an emerging future leader in Jamaica and the Caribbean. Ms. Hanna is the Shadow Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. She also has responsibilities for Jamaican diaspora affairs. We spoke about Ms. Hannah's motivation to serve in the political arena, her perspectives on Jamaica's current foreign policy, her perspectives on Jamaican and Caribbean diaspora affairs, and a number of other topical issues. Up next on Carib Nation TV. Welcome, Honor, Honorable Lisa Hanna, Member of Parliament, representing the Great Parish of St. Anne. Well, a part of the parish, not all of it. Well, Southeast St. <laughs> Anne. Yes. Uh, um, Miss Hanna, people have different reasons for entering representational politics. What was mm -hmm. your... I always wanted to serve my country. I had done it at several different levels when I was growing up. I was a volunteer for Jamal, which was a Jamaica advanced movement for adult literacy when I was younger. I um, volunteered for the World Hunger Project. I did a number of things and even in high school. And after university and traveling the world, seeing the world, it was important for me to give back. And I thought that the I think I'm a natural lover of politics. And while I was traveling the world, I met some great leaders and that was certainly exciting and important in the world. And I saw some very dynamic things happening. And I was exposed to and mentored by some really good leaders in Jamaica. PJ Patterson was one of them, Portia Simpson Miller, was another person. And I had even seen um, history and read enough history to know about the kind of Jamaica I wanted to live in and the kind of Jamaica I wanted to have my children where my child grew up in. And the values of Norman Manley was where I, I rested my hat. And so it was an easy sojourn or entry into, into politics because I saw politics not as a dirty game, although it is a blood sport. And sometimes I believe that the women are targeted even more so than the men. But I saw it as a real opportunity to build Jamaica. And I really loved how I saw Norman Manley go around the country giving people a voice ordinary people of voice, even coming out in the early 1930s. I mean, here was a, a man who had, was a Rhodes Scholar. He had done well. He was a athlete. You know, he fought in the war. And at the same time, he was very, very clear that as, as the intelligentsia, there needed to be a movement of persons who understood that education and their voice and workers' rights were important for taking a country and moving it from the bastion and bastardization of colonialism. And even though it was a hundred years after the emancipation of slavery, Jamaican people did not have dignity. And I thought that Norman Manley and through the People's National Party, we, we needed to give people dignity. And, and, and if someone like myself, who had been built by Jamaica, was able to now go in from the inside and, and work with people and, and teach people. That's what I saw my role in politics with. And oftentimes it's, it's very, very nasty and it's, it's brutal. But I, I, on the whole, I mean, when I decide to leave, I, I would have been worth the wait for having received great lessons and, and 
made great friendships and give something back to the country, which was ultimately what I wanted to do. So after all these many years in the rough and tough of polit politics, <laughs> do you still feel the same way? I do. Yeah, that's what really? gets me up in the mornings. That's what has me go to my constituency every day. Uh, if, I, if I'm feeling down, I go to my constituency. Wonderful. And... You know, you get the cussing too. I mean, I got a serious <laughs> cussing from some people yesterday because of a particular road. And it's, it's understandable. I mean, the, the, when you have the largest constituency, you have the largest road network too. And they don't realize that a lot of times the money is to fix the road is also decentralized to the parish council and the NWA and different agencies. So, you know, I've, I've learned over time that some in, in the bid to make life easier for people, it makes it even more difficult because when, I'm, when the elders speak to me about back in the old days of the public works department, when the, you know, the supervisor used to go out the road, they used to look good. It really isn't my job to, to, try and get people like the NWA and the parish council and TEF and all these agencies to beg them to fix the road. It, it should be the, your known responsibility. But alas, over time, um, when the people need representation, it's their member of parliament and I, I'm happy to do that. Great. You served as Minister of Youth and Culture during the period, I think, 2012 to 2016. Correct. What did you find most challenging, in particular, in the youth portfolio? The youth portfolio, and I also had children. So I actually was the minister in charge of the majority of, of, of the population at the time, because zero to 80 makes, makes up 800,000 people in the country. And then you also have um, 25 to 30. So it was a, it was a big population. The biggest challenge was to get our youth motivated because education was a separate ministry, but I was in charge of the National Youth Service, the Child Development Agency, um, other opportunities for unattached youth, youth clubs, etc. And it was difficult because the distractions that are and the information that's coming into a number of young people about the Jamaica that they want and the opportunities for themselves. I found the most difficult cohort was the unattached population. That's about 120,000 young people who perhaps went through school and did not come out with anything to matriculate forward. And we spent, a, a, we had centers that they could go to some of them could we developed new projects in the NYS. But it was the difficulty was making sure that that segment of the population understood their roles, their rights, their talent, and steering them in a direction that could have them feel empowered. I mean, you, you had the youth clubs and Jamaican youth are resilient and talented. And so you had other programs, but I found that was the most difficult and the other part that i found very difficult was the levels of neglect of our children from parents because those were the number one reports that we would get and looking at the statistics that would come in for children with uncontrolled behavior as determined by the state and children who were molested and, and we have a lot of incest in jamaica that goes under the quiet and so we, we did a number of things through the Child Development Agency, one of the, the legacy programs I'm proudest of was when I became minister, we only had one, two children qualifying for college. By the time I left, we had over 120 children qualifying for college and university because we took a hands-on approach in mentorship of our children in our children's homes and places of state care. We also introduced Art for Life programs where children could have cultural programs. So we married the culture portfolio with the children portfolio. So by the time I left as minister, Jamaica had, in, had gone up 60 spaces on the UNICEF index in protecting the best rights of children. And the United Nations actually came to Jamaica for, with Marius, um, Marta Santos Pice, who was a special envoy to the UN Secretary General at the time. And she held the conference here 
um, for other countries to come to to see what Jamaica had done in such a short space of time to improve the lives of children and especially in children in lockup and state care. So those are difficulties and um, I'm still very, very keen on protecting children and I'm still very keen on single mother issues and still very, very keen on discipline issues and still very keen on, on trying to get our youth motivated. And um, that actually occupies a lot of my, my time as an MP in my own constituency. I saw a recent video on social media <laughs> talking about abuse of women, that women had problems walking down the street mm -hmm. and without being molested by men. Do you see that as a big problem? When I walk on the street, I get the psst, a hey, baby. You know, it's, it's Jamaican men do call out to you. It's, it's, it has been a cultural practice of ours. I've, I've been in my political career, when I first went into politics, I was grabbed by people who feel that they had men who felt that they had the right to, you know, to perhaps do that. And um, as a karate black belt, I think they saw another side of me because he ended up <laughs> on the floor. And I've had that done to me several times because I, I tend not to go in entourages everywhere. So yes, I would say that women are and can be victims of serious, casual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and domestic abuse. We're seeing more of that in Jamaica. And it's disturbing because I believe that both men and women need to protect each other. And I've seen where children who get into fights come from abusive homes where they see their fathers beating their mothers. So we have to grapple with that as a country. And it's, a, it's an ugly underbelly of who we are. As a female member of parliament, I stand ready all the time to help protect our women. And I stand to protect our men too. The issue though is that our women need significant training to come out because a lot of them suffer from battered women syndrome. Some of our music as well really perpetuate the kinds of abuse that is unwarranted. So many of us sing the songs, but there is a dissonance and a disconnect that those songs without other kinds of intervention would be or is disastrous in some cases. So if you keep in the diaspora of having a very measured approach towards taking the right decision on behalf of persons. So we're not confrontational. We don't get involved in people's politics. We stand on the right side of history, I always believe. And I, I think certainly our role, my role as, as the shadow spokesperson, shadow spokesperson on foreign policy is to enlighten our own country as to the role we have played. You are okay. the shadow minister for foreign affairs and foreign trade mm -hmm. for your party, who is currently in opposition. Mm -hmm. How do you currently, first of all, how do you see your role and how do you evaluate our current foreign policy? Well, the current foreign policy of the government, which I have said before, is or resembles the doctrine of doing nothing because we have not truly put our country first and taking principled positions in the best interest of Jamaica. And what do I mean with that? by that? Over the years, Jamaica has had an enviable record of human rights, of being non-confrontational, being sought after 
to be the mediator if countries are having problems and to stay on the right side of history. And so I just have to point to our leaders in the past who have fought to get rid of apartheid and not trade with South Africa back in the 50s before we had independence when that was under Norman Manley, when we had Michael Manley in terms of South-South Corporation and basically saying to the United States, look, we hear you, but these are our friends. You know, Africa is our friends. These are people who look like us and we want to open trading relations. Jamaica has, and certainly with PJ Patterson and the work that he did with the ACP and building CARICOM and leading CARICOM from the front, and Comrade Portia Simpson Miller as well, Prime Minister Portia Simpson Miller, who made sure that her, her role in the multilateral agencies for Jamaica was sown so that we could, we could really fix our economy. What has happened now is that Jamaica has taken an almost might is right approach and tag teamed with our major trading partner to acquiesce in be, doing their bidding at the United Nations. That's why we, for the first time, basically we had abstained from the, the crucial UN vote on Jerusalem. That is why we go in and, and we're okay in expropriating shares of a country, of a, of a company from a country that has stood with us as a friend for many years. I, that's why we voted the way we did or abstained at the OAS when the head of the OAS and the rest of CARICOM, so we deviated from CARICOM and we've always stood firm with CARICOM and I'm a regionalist. That is why you're not really seeing the kind of activism coming out of Jamaica. And I find that we're less activist. Jamaican, the Jamaican governments, so, you know, have always been activist on issues. You could feel the reverberation of who we are as a government in international affairs. Our voice was very, very clear. No, it seems mundane. No, it seems that we're just checking the boxes to make sure we're doing everything right. We need to be a little bit more firebrand. We need to be more on the cutting edge of leadership in the world. That is what I want my country to be. That is who I, what I see our foreign policy as. Keeping the friends that we have and making new friends at all times. And we need to get back into Africa. We need to have those kinds of sound relations with Africa. We need to, 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 to stand with those countries that are similar to ours. You know, the, the next trading and economic superpowers are small, tiny countries on the borders. Um, and cities within Brazil and within China and different countries. But what you have is, is our bigger countries, like the United States, telling us who we should be friends with. We were never that person. We were never persons to say, well, all right, you, we're not friends with you either because we have a new best friend and they told us not to be your friend. We've never had that value system. And so that's not my value system. If you're my friend, you're my friend. And we've always made friends of all and any that's a kind of foreign policy, I believe in. You, you, you mentioned CARICOM and that you're a regionalist. And many of us who also believe in Caribbean integration have observed in the past few years that CARICOM is floundering. We have observed a deficit in terms of leadership in CARICOM. How do you see Jamaica's current role in CARICOM compared to what the role of a PNP government would be? Well, I think the Mia Motley, Prime Minister Mia Motley, has renewed the vitality of CARICOM. I think she has certainly, and when I watched the Christian Amanpour video with her talking about CARICOM, um, she was very, very clear 
on what needs to happen for the region. And I really appreciate her leadership. I was disappointed with our leadership when Prime Minister Holness was there because I thought we could have done more. I felt as if his role there was trying to talk down to the other countries that we, it, it wasn't going to work. And I didn't think that was necessary. I think there, there's strength in numbers. And when you have 14 countries, individual sovereign states who make up a trading block, we should always be protective of that and we should build it and make it more, more powerful. I think we could be more powerful if we really, really had that kind of thrust. But I, I am impressed with Prime Minister Motley. I think she's, she's doing the right things. I think even when Secretary of State Pompeo was coming here and did not invite her as a chair of CALICOM, was a very clear signal by the United States of picking off countries that they did not see as friends. And I think she stood her ground. And I'm proud of her for doing it. I, I respect her for doing it. I, I, I applaud her. And as, as a younger politician looking up to a woman and a prime minister, I, I really have to say kudos to her. So I, I'm actually seeing um, that kind of coalescing again. And I, I was, was heartened also by many of our CARICOM neighbors coming out to say that they did not appreciate how they were dealing with Cuba and the medical workers. Our own spokesperson on health dealt with it, um, Maurice Guy, MP, Dr. Maurice Guy. And that is how we have to be because if we're not ambassador, larger countries will pick us up and the world needs to understand that we operate as one voice in this region because if, if they decide to have unrest as small island developing states, we are going to flounder. Climate change affects us. We need to speak as one voice for making sure we have the kind of debt write-off when, when our countries are ravaged by hurricanes. And we need, we need that kind of vitality. So I know she's speaking on our behalf and I'm, I'm happy about it. You're right. Um, um, Prime Minister Motley is indeed stepping up and providing leadership. And we are hoping that in the future we can see some of that coming from other countries as well. I, I know we will soon run out of time. So I, I want to switch real quick to the mm -hmm. Jamaican diaspora because that's in your portfolio. And mm -hmm. as you know, the diaspora has a history of support for Jamaica in good times. Give me your perspectives on what you see as the role of the Jamaican diaspora and the role of the Jamaican government in terms of how the government should be engaging with the diaspora. The Jamaican diaspora punches way above its weight class. And every time Jamaica is, or has critical issues that it can't resolve, and we need hope, we turn to the Jamaican diaspora because they have done so well in the various industries that they are, and they lead everything they go into, our nurses, our teachers, our business, um, men and women, I think it is imperative that the Jamaican diaspora is also seen as a Jamaican population, not because some of them or persons chose to go away means that they're not supremely connected genetically to us as Jamaicans. And we need to continue to help them wherever they are, because that is our role as well. If there's a Jamaican overseas, we have a responsibility to make sure they are safe and protected. We need to see them as playing an active role in our country in building our country and investing in our country and having the kinds of programs that makes it easy. They give tremendous help in terms of charities and help in organizations. And we need to make that easier for them to do it I hear all too often persons saying, boy, you know, we're trying to get goods there and, 
I've had to help people because it's on the wharf and they can't get it off. So there, there are some simple things we need to address, Ambassador. But just to say that I see the diaspora as integral to our own development. And we need more persons in the diaspora. We need to push them to play more leadership roles in the countries that they're in. Because Jamaica is strong when we have strong leaders around the world. When you have a Jamaican in Congress, like a, like a you know, before I know her daughter, Yvette Clark, we need more Jamaicans who are in Congress and who are in the Senate in, in the United States and, and certainly over in, in the United Kingdom. Because persons need to understand that our history and our color and who we are in building those economies, like the UK, is as a direct lineage of, of the Windrush population, for example, and persons going over there with our values. So we need to make sure that the legislation that they have also keep us in mind and that we are very strong in, in, in legitimizing the kinds of laws that we want to see in these countries. Because if more Jamaicans and Caribbean persons were in, in that situation who were who are helped. You couldn't have a situation where people are, are, are carrying a, a narrative that is looking at Cuban medical officers and workers as us harboring human terrorists or, or traffickers. It, 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 it's foreign to me. You know, it's, 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 it's painful to me. It's, 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 it's not how I think. And I think we need to start looking at getting more of our people in leadership in the diaspora, in the, in the different countries. You've been very generous with your time. And no, it's we very much appreciate it. And we just want to thank you for being our guest on Carib Nation TV. Is there thank anything you. else you'd like to add? I know you have to go. I, just, I really just want to say to you congratulations for all the work that you're doing to keep the fire of, of people's critical thinking alive and to present a modus for people to understand the real facts and issues. I think what you're doing is important work. I think we need to get that voice out a lot more in terms of presenting foreign policy in a way that people really connect the dots and understand it because foreign policy affects everybody's life and foreign trade affects persons' lives. And just to say to persons who are watching that keep the faith, keep the hope alive. Those of us who are in Jamaica are always mindful of those of you who are overseas who contribute in so many different ways, whether remittances to persons in my constituency more on a local level, but to our hospitals, to our healthcare, to helping children, you know, in children's homes, to giving scholarships for young, for young people to go to back to school and for, for university. Those things are not unnoticed by me. And I'm, I feel very, very good to know that we still have kind, generous Jamaicans who as a part of their everyday thinking, always thinks about their country, always thinks about how I can help Jamaica, how we can do something. You know, that is important, and, and I just want to say thank you. Well, thank you for thanking <laughs> us. And again, thank you for joining us on Carib Nation TV, and we look forward to having you back sometime Maybe, in the future. Sure. Maybe in a Thanks, different Ambassador. Capacity. Who knows? Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Until next time, this is Ambassador Curtis Ward, host of Carib Nation TV and editor and publisher of the Ward Post.